This morning, we're going to make pigs fly with bacon. Who wants some bacon? Ha, 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 ha. I see it. Hey. Oh, Lynn wants one. There's one. Pigs just flew. That's how pigs fly. I'm not going to throw it hard, okay, bud? There you go. Anybody else eat breakfast every morning? Karen, you want it? Oh, right here. Right there. There you go. How many have heard the term, when pigs fly? It's a sarcastic play on words of how that'll happen when pigs fly or over my dead body or it'll be a cold. Okay, I won't finish that one, but you know what I'm talking about, right? And it's interesting that when we talk about miracles, uh, some people's perception of that was, is that was for those days. They aren't really for today. I just had a conversation with a dear friend of mine who actually believed that he, he believes that the whole thing is just a miracle. It's not like God is really doing miracles today. And so last week we studied the miracle of deliverance and how many prayed over their kids this week and over their families this week in the name of Jesus. How many did that? Praise God. That's the way that we get power. We have the authority, maybe not the power. Remember the analogy I used with the policeman with the power and the authority. But in the name of Jesus, we have the authority to stand in the gaps for our families and for our friends and for people around us. And so that's what we studied last week. This week, I'm super excited because some of you, how many have not heard Becky's miracle story in its entirety? Have not? Raise your hands. Oh, wow, Beck, look around. So we've got a new audience here. And for those of you who, um, who have heard it before, just bear with us. We're trying to keep this thing interesting. And I think they're going to give me 45 minutes to do it. So I've got a few minutes here till, till that needs to start. Uh, in Scripture, you can read about miracles all through the Old Testament. Uh, Elijah raised the dead son. Or Elijah raises a dead boy from... from uh, from death. Hannah has a miraculous birth. You guys know those stories in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, when you get into the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there are over 30 miracles stated there. And inside of that, it also implies that he did hundreds of them while he was on earth. And even after he left, you know the story about Paul preached so long that Eutychus fell asleep and he fell out of the window. Now, I know that I preach boring sometimes because I see some of you sleeping. I can actually see that from up here. <laughs> but to my knowledge, no one has ever fallen to their death through my preaching. But Paul gets down and he goes down and he lays hands on this Eutychus and he raised him up from the dead. That was after Jesus had ascended. So I think, though, the most controversial, my mother-in-law, I love my mother-in-law, but she also enjoyed my jokes about mother-in-laws. But I think the... the <laughs> She did. She, I was her favorite son-in-law. Why wouldn't she? She is not here to defend this, but I think the most controversial miracle inside of Scripture is when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And some, I will tell you, that's probably why Peter denied him three times. <laughs> that was a bad joke, wasn't it? Uh, I'm going to quit those jokes, Eli. I promise you I will. I've got a whole list of them, though. i got to keep going with it. i got to use them up sometime. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? But God does heal today. And what I want to, this here is the point that I want to drive home with you guys before we start this story. God does heal today, but he doesn't heal everyone all the time. He doesn't heal everyone all the time. Hopefully by the end of today, you'll understand why he doesn't. There's three reasons why he doesn't, and I'll try to uh, go through them real fast for you. Uh, the number one reason that God doesn't heal sometimes is he doesn't, Jesus never once did a miracle to prove himself. He never once did. You can read all through scripture, the 30 miracles that are recorded. He never did. In fact, in Mark chapter 8, verses 11 through 12, Haley, he says this, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. To test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. And he sighed deeply. Everybody go, oh. that's how Jesus sighed. It's like, seriously, 
I'm, I did that this morning already. Are you serious? You want another cookie? Somebody needs to put more money in the pot, don't they, Kurt? He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. And so that, to me, tells me that Jesus does not need to do a miracle there to prove who he is. And I don't think he needs to do it today. He doesn't need to do it to prove who he is. He didn't need to heal Becky to prove who he was. How many agree with that? The second thing that I want you to understand before we get into this story is God, Jesus never performed a miracle that interfered with God's will. Want me to say it again? Jesus never performed a miracle that interfered with God's will, his ultimate plan. And so I will tell you that had Becky's ultimate plan in life been done, she would not be here. And so when that happened to Becky and she was healed and she's sitting here this morning, it makes me believe that God's not done with her and it makes me press in and figure out what is it that God does want from her. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, it kind of explains what I'm trying to say when Jesus says, don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly. How many believe that? He could do it. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? <laughs> We're facing a big dilemma in our country, are we not? On Tuesday is the biggest election that I can ever remember. And you would think, God, you have to perform a miracle like we know we have to have uh, you, there could be two sides in here I don't know but if he doesn't know this that it's not his will God's will will be done through this election God's will will be done in your life God's will will be done in my life and it's going to be done in Becky's life but it, those miracles will never interfere with God's will. The third thing, and then we'll get to the story, is Jesus never did a miracle when there was no faith. That's a big one. He never did a miracle where there was no faith. There had to be faith. He talks about his hometown. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. He says, he, he did not do many miracles there because of what? Their lack of faith. That's why Jesus didn't do it in his hometown. He wasn't welcome to do it there. They were like, this is Joseph's son. There ain't no way he's doing that. And I remember so well, and we'll get into some of the story, like, that's Jimmy Mass's wife. You mean Jimmy, the guy that, yeah, that guy. There ain't no way he's healing her. She's done. She messed up when she married him. Your faith moves the heart of God. Doesn't matter how big or how small. Your faith moves the heart of God. You know the woman with the issue of blood as she reached out to touch the hem of the garment. And what did Jesus say? He says, what happened to me? I, lost, I felt something. And then he goes and tells her this in Mark chapter 5, verse 34. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. I've had to do a lot of studying on this miracle thing. Because I got questioned a lot. Why did God heal Becky and not my husband? Why did God heal Becky and not me. Hey, why does he heal my back and he doesn't heal someone with cancer? Is that fair? Why does he heal my toothache and not someone with a heart attack? There's a difference there. You see what I'm trying to say? The man that had leprosy fell at the feet of Jesus and worshiped and in Luke chapter 17 verse 19 he said this to him, rise and go, your Y'all finish it for me. Your has made you well. 
The blind man that screams out says, Jesus, have mercy on me. You know that one in Mark chapter 10, verse 52. He says, Jesus said, go, your has healed you. January of 2012, Steve Lapp called me. Becky, if you'll come up. And Karma, I'm going to ask you to come up too. So you guys know I love to tell stories, but a lot of times I don't put enough details in the story. I'm not emphatic enough, and I don't like give enough. Uh, I don't stretch it very often. And uh, <laughs> what? So I asked Karma to come up. She's the referee today. This is Karma, Becky's one of Becky's many friends, but probably one of her closest friends here at church. And. Uh, <laughs> so I asked her to come up and referee just in case this would be one of those times that I exaggerate something. I don't want to do that. This is a story that I am feel very honored to carry for God. And what I want you to know is God did this and he did it through partially my faith, but he did it through many of you who were here at Light in the Valley. Your faith came into play in this. It's nothing that Jimmy Mast has done or Becky has done or Light in the Valley. It is solely what God has done. Amen? We have to have faith. That has to be here. But God heals, not me. And I need you to know that. And this is where I went all across, well, how many churches? 35, 40 churches now from Belize we were in Belize and we got to share there. Uh, from Belize to Pennsylvania, Florida, all over the place, God has invited us to go. And it actually is what gave me a platform to preach from. And so this is how my ministry started is through this miracle. So I will get started. Uh, Karma, would you just introduce yourself? And, and here, yeah, I'll shut up just for a minute. Lord, help me, please. <clears throat> go ahead. This is Karma. I'm Karma. Can, can you speak into the I'm mic? I'm Karma. Uh -huh. I did not realize that I was going to be up here today. So. See, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is great. Um, so yeah. I asked Karma to come up here because in her hand, she has the original papers that she jotted things down pretty much daily of, of things that would happen. And so that is the referee's guidebook. She's going to go by that, and if I say something out of line, she's going to, like, blow the whistle, and she's going to stop me. So, Beck, who are you? Some of these people have no idea who you are. I'm Becky, and yeah. I am the one that carries the miracle. Yeah, okay. So, very good. So, they, uh, Becky really doesn't remember much. <laughs> she was out, so she probably won't talk much, but I'm going to expect karma to chime in a little bit every once in a while, and I'm open to that. Uh, but let's start back in January of 2012. Steve Lapp, the pastor over at Berean Community Church, called me and asked me if I would take my dysfunctional band called Live Amped. It was kind of a mix between Leonard Skinner and Chris Tomlin. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to explain it. Like, we would go from, like, like the cars to, oh, how, we're, oh, how great art thou art, you know, how great thou art, that, that type of thing. We, like, did all kinds of crazy stuff, and, and very talented group of people. Kurt, would you not agree? Kurt was along with it, but he didn't get to go with, uh, with us to Pennsylvania that weekend. But he asked us to go to Pennsylvania. Steve Lapp did, and so we went over there. Uh, I, I did not want to go, uh, but we left here on April the 11th. It was on a Thursday, and uh, we get over there to, to PA and go through this orientation, and we literally did not fit in there at all. Uh, there was about 300 volunteers, all of who were fairly conservative, and, and, and I, my guys have nose rings and lip rings and tattoos and throwing cigarettes into the bushes out front. So it was like, uh, did we, they came in and, you know, smelled like smoke, and it was like embarrassing for me, but hey, they were talented musicians, and they were willing to go to this prison and play. We went to this prison, and we played. And we played Friday night. Saturday, I got up early and went into the prison with the other volunteers, and we had this Bible study with some of the people. And inside of that Bible study, I became very good friends 
with a black guy named John. And me and John had a connection. Now, I don't know if it was whether I come from South Carolina and I understand him better than most, but me and him got really, really close throughout the day on Saturday. And John told me that he would never see the light of day, that he had committed a crime, and I never had the nerve to ask him what it was. It didn't matter to me. I loved this man. He was awesome. And he would sit beside me when I get done singing. He'd come sit beside me. So Saturday night, there was this powerful evangelist. And uh, forgive me, I can't tell you his name right now. But he had a Bible big enough to float across the Atlantic with. It was like, it was one of these big ones. You know what I'm talking about. And he comes up and he starts preaching. And he preached about the blood of Jesus. It was a great, great message. Through that message, John reached over and he handed me this paper. He goes, hey man. He said, I just feel the Holy Spirit telling me to give you this. And I looked at it, and I wish I should have copied it and put it up there. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll have it up here. I don't dare pass it all the way through. This, is, this guy's special to me. I'm going to lay it up here. If you want to see it afterwards, you can. But it's got a picture of folded hands praying, and then it's got in calligraphy font prayer request, and that's printed. But then he took his pen, and he wrote a scripture reference up top and he said the holy spirit told me to give you this i want you to study it and i looked at it and i'm like okay thanks man i stick it in my bible and i take it and saturday night we played again at the end and i mean these guys were into it and sunday morning we were into it we actually blew two of the speakers in our system we got it so loud and it was crazy and we had a blast with this and Sunday evening, we drove from that prison, we drove over to Lidditz, Pennsylvania. We set up in a church there. Every, all of our equipment, and two speakers are blown, and we're like trying. It was worse than this morning, power going out, honestly. And we were trying to play this worship set for this church. We did it. We tore everything down, and we start for home. And we get home April the 15th on a Monday morning. We drove all night, got home here at the church at 4 a.m., at 4.20 a.m., I got home, and I had my Bible in one of those little man purses. Yeah, I got one. You do too. Just shut up. <laughs> and I take my man purse and throw it on the kitchen table, and I take my luggage up to the bathroom. And Becky is awake, and she goes, hey, I hadn't seen her since Thursday, and this is Monday. And uh, Monday morning, the kids come in, say goodbye to go to school. I, I, I go to bed. I go to sleep. Kids come in and say goodbye to go and go to school. And of course, Tuesday, I had an appointment in a contract with Rob Van Winkle. How many know who he is? How about Vanilla Ice? Ah. Had a, I had a contract with him on an entertainment center there in a house in Winesburg that he was going to show Shrocks and, you know, this whole deal. And uh, so that was on Tuesday. And I knew, I mean, I had been gone for four days. I told Beck, I got to get and make sure that that thing's ready to install. And I, you know, had all this stuff. And she goes, you stay in bed. You've been up for 23 hours. Stay in bed. So make a long story short, she goes to Amish door to eat breakfast. And when she comes home, I heard someone talking in the foyer down, downstairs. And I'm like, man, who's that? And I must have fell back asleep. It was April 15th. We had to get our taxes done that day. We were, had to get our return sent out that day. And I had an appointment for that with our accountant. And uh, next thing I know, I wake up, and she's like this. She's on top of the bed at about a 2 o'clock position to me. I'm under the covers trying to sleep. <laughs> and she wakes me up. She goes, honey. Honey. I'm like, hey, hey. I said, who is here? And she said, Rita. And in my mind, I thought it was, she has a sister named Rita, and then she has one of her other best friends, Larry Rita. So in my mind, I'm thinking it was her sister Rita, because they had went out to eat. You get it? I just figured Rita came back with her, and they're talking. Didn't even pay it any mind. And I said, where's Mason? Mason was seven months old at the time. She said, he's in the crib downstairs. And what time was that? That she, so in that, she sends karma. She sent me a text at 1123. 1123 a.m. She sent me a photo. It was a photo. Mm -hmm. 
So this was sort of like a, a runway in our bathroom. Like, yeah. How does this outfit look? Yeah, how does this outfit yeah. look? That type of deal. She <laughs> sends that at 1123. 1123. And then she, she actually did that while she's talking to me. And all of a sudden, through our conversation, she said, are you hungry? And I said, yeah. She said, oh, I should have brought you some French toast. I had stuffed French toast at Amish door. I should have brought that for you. Uh, I said, well, we'll just stop at Boys and eat. She said, okay, let's do that. I said, well, I got to get up. She goes, honey, love me. And I'm like, oh, baby, you know I love you. And I reached over to kiss her. And as I did, her head flew out of her hands and hit me right here in the side. And I'm like, back. In my mind, the first thing that comes to my mind is stop playing. Like, I know that you're needy, but good grief. Let's get, like, this is not cool. Like, and I'm like, back. And I hear something like a gurgling noise, and I pick her head up, and there's a lot of, like, discharge coming out of her mouth. Her face is completely blue, and Jimmy Mass freaked out. Now, I don't get excited very quickly. It takes me a while, but I jumped out of bed fairly instantly. And at that point in time, we had Harley Paul's daughter, Rachel, and Sarah were renting our maid's quarters over on the other side of the house. And I went over there, and I'm beating on the door, and then I'm thinking, oh, they're both servers at Dutchman's. They're not home. And I ran back, and I'm like, I, I needed help. And I'm like, Becky, 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 she's like, slobbering at the mouth. Her, her eyes are wide open, and she's blue as, uh, very blue. And uh, so I dial 911, and my speaker phone is the only thing that worked on my phone. My phone, like this, did not work, just my speaker phone. And so I dial 911. I tell her what's going on. She asked me if I can pick her up. I said, yeah. And I, I, she said, well, pick her up and put her on the floor. So I went to pick her up, and all around here, her jeans, she had completely wet herself, which I knew from a little bit of experience that that is not a good sign. That's usually the last thing that happens to someone when they pass away. And so I am literally freaking out at this point. I do have the 911 call here, but I'm not going to play it for you this morning. I'm a little embarrassed. So I put her on the floor, and throughout this, she, the 911 operator asked me if I can administer CPR. I had never done that before, and so she stepped me through it. I started to do CPR. How many know how? How many don't? Just let's not figure it out. Go to the American uh, Heart Association website. They will give you a tutorial on there how to do it. Do that. Watch it. At least you have a little bit of an inkling of what to do. So I had to prop her up. And, and start to do CPR. And I started to do this, and in between compressions, she said, hey, I'm looking at your house on this screen, like on an overhead. Which door do you want the 911 or the EMTs to come to? And I told them the front, and she said, all right, I need you to stop doing compressions. I need you to run down. I need you to open that door so they know which door to come in. And then I need you to come right back. I need you to promise me you'll come right back. I said, I'll be back. So I ran down the stairs, left Becky there, Went, opened the front door, came back, and that was probably the hardest part is to start doing CPR again. Because I remember she was very, very cold and very clammy. Her lips looked like someone had taken a black eyeliner or a Sharpie and outlined all around her mouth. They were black. And it was just like, I can't, like, I, I, but it's my wife. You're going to do it. And so I started to do CPR again. Edwin Miller shows up with his tractor. He's an EMT driving a tractor, and he comes in there, and he took control of the situation very, very rapidly because he tells me later he didn't know if I was making out with her or actually doing CPR. <laughs> I, 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 it's the truth. She said it's a bad joke, but it's what he told me. I mean, he literally got on top and pushed her sternum about two inches from the floor. I could hear it cracking in there. And I'm like, dude, that's my wife. But anyway, they shocked her twice in the bedroom. When the EMTs got there, they brought the defibrillators in, shocked her twice and in the bedroom. And then they did it again when they got in the squad. They had called for an EMT who was licensed to administer uh, an adrenaline type of drug because none of them could. 
and it was adrenaline type of drug that they administered. And her heart rate, my 911 call went out. Do you have this? 1137. 1137. So we feel like her heart stopped between 1135 and 1136. Gave me about less than about a minute to get the phone, dial 911, and get it registered to the department. And then they came. Do you have more times there? What time did the squad leave? I have the squad left at 12.04. The squad left our house at 12.04 after they had shocked her now three times, twice in the bedroom, once in the squad at the house. There was no pulse. I had no pulse. They had no pulse. There was just nothing there. And so they started driving towards Millersburg. And, and by the time, well, they wouldn't let me ride in the squad because she had coded whatever, what, code red, is that what that is? Some kind of code that they wouldn't let me ride in the squad. And so I called Furman on the way out to the hospital. Furman was the pastor here at the time. And I called him and I said, dude, I don't know what is going on, but you need to meet me at the hospital now. And he's doing meals for meals on wheels that day, and he actually leaves those people hanging. They're probably still waiting on their meal. But he leaves them hanging and takes off for Millersburg and comes out there and meets me. So grateful that he did. And he started a prayer chain that day, inst like right away. And you guys get the call. I don't know who all got those messages, but you got the message right away there on Monday the 15th. And uh, I walk into the hospital, and of course, out in Millersburg, I know most of who's there. Dr. Stan Boyd was working on her. Julia Klink was there. Deb Schrock was there. And these are all names that you guys as locals would know. They're working on my wife. The tears are literally flowing down Julie's, uh, or Julia, is it Julia? Julia Klink. Um, her face, like her makeup's all messed up. And she's like, you know, she doesn't understand because she used to party with Becky. Don't tell anybody. Okay, I won't. <laughs> was that inappropriate? What? Oh, no, bunny trail. It's how our life was. And uh, so she, like, Jimmy, I don't understand. I don't either. You know, we're trying our best. And if we can get her pupils to dilate, she can be transported via helicopter to Altman. And so we're doing like this, and she's shining the light. We're doing like this. And this happened for probably 15 minutes before we finally got her pupil to dilate. By the way, let's back up. 1206, squad leaves, meets Steve Miller out at Plumber John's on 62. Some of you visitors don't know where that is. It's in between Winesburg and Berlin. And there is where he leaves his vehicle, jumps in the back, and realizes that it's Becky. And after they shocked, he administered the drug right away. And after they shocked her for the sixth time, she had a slight heartbeat, and that came through at 12.10 p.m. Does that make sense? So Steve was driving from Holmes Lumber out in Millersburg, Berlin, and meeting, coming back to Winesburg and gets to Plumber John. They're, they're driving towards each other. He jumps in the back, leaves his vehicle there, and, and started working on Becky. And they actually did get a heartbeat back. So from 11.35 to 12.10 is what is documented as no measurable heartbeat and when we got to Millersburg they had pronounced Becky clinically dead now I didn't know that there was a difference between clinical death and biological death but they had already pronounced her clinical dead clinically dead and so they are frantically getting her to work getting working on her and now they do have a little bit of a heartbeat her EF her ejection fraction was at eight it was at 8. It's supposed to be at 55 to 60. Yeah. And here it was at 8, just hanging, just if basically her heart's doing like this, not doing much at all. And we had to then, as soon as we got her pupil to dilate, we got her in a squad again and took her to the fairgrounds. By the way, you guys with money, start donating to Millersburg Hospital so they can get a helipad right there on the premises. This sucked. We had to drive out to fairgrounds to put her in the chopper. And from there, they wouldn't let me get in the chopper there either. They said they had just filled up with gas and, the, gas and there's a weight limit. It's a nice way of saying you're overweight, you're not flying. <laughs> so Furman drives me to Altman. 
And by the time we got past 62, I mean, the realization of what was happening started to sink in. But to this point, I was pretty much in shock. But now all of a sudden, I'm like, this is not good. She was without a heartbeat for 35 minutes. She's not going to make it. Like these, these thoughts started to sink into my head. And Anyway, I had called karma. Some point in that time, I had called karma. And I said, well, I called my sister-in-law, Rita. I called the family, and Rita was like, well, I wasn't there. And I'm like, well, who was? Then it hit me. It's Larry Rita. So I called Larry Rita. I'm like, what did you do to her? <laughs> I didn't. I promise. I did not do that. But I was like, what was your conversation like? And she was like, well, she was putting in a, you guys putting in a fireplace with a TV there in the living room. And she was getting Becky to help her with co coordinate colors with that. And she was like, we stepped outside to look at him in the sun so we get direct light. So there was really nothing. She said, I said, did you notice anything about Becky? No, not at all. Becky had no precursor, nothing, nothing previous to this, nothing. And yet they're claiming it's a postpartum cardiomyopathy. Does anybody know what that is? Postpartum, after birth, cardiomyopathy, enlargement of the heart. So after birth, enlargement of the heart, but Mason's seven months old. Normally this happens right away or within a month to two months of birth. This was seven months. And there was no blockage on the heart. They did all kinds of scans. They did all kinds of tests. There was just no blockage. There was no reason that a 37-year-old female, healthy, should be in this condition. So we life flight her to Altman. By the time me and Furman get to Altman, John Pulowski comes in. He was the, the doctor up there. And uh, what did he tell me? Karma has this written down. What, what, I remember, what I remember that he told you was we can fix from here down, but we can't fix from here up. Yeah. And he said even if she's okay from here up, he said she will for the rest of her life have to have a cart with her um, with a machine on it that will make her heart work for her. Yeah. Um, that she will always have that machine with her. A heart pump basically in a bag and then also oxygen. Was, yes. was one thing that I read. So he was like, she'll be highly handicapped for the rest of her life. And this hit me like, no, I mean, I've got three kids that desperately need a mom. I am a helpless, helpless single man, I promise you. I can't boil water correctly. And I need my wife. And desperation started to set in in my my, like, this was just not cool. And he said, John Pulowski also said, he said, hey, you know, I don't know. I don't see anything wrong. I don't know of anything that I can do to fix it. Like, this is beyond us. The only test that I haven't done is, is on her valves around her heart to see if there's a leak in her valve. And if it is, it's going to need to be done immediately. So why don't we transport you up to Cleveland Clinic? I'm like, what? We went to Millersburg this morning. We're in Altman now. And now we're going to Cleveland Clinic. Would you sign here? And when I did, he said, I said, what is this? And he said, we're going to take her body temperature from 98 to 91. I'm like, really? Seven degrees? Yeah. He said, that will preserve any leftover brain tissue that she has. And I'm like, you're serious about like she, he said, normally within the first 90 seconds, of someone losing their heart rate. Every second beyond that, I forget the percentage that he told me that their brain mass just shrinks away. And their chances of survival are very, very slim. And if they do survive, they will be highly handicapped because their body barely tells them to breathe. And with 35 minutes of non-oxygenated blood to the brain, your chances are very, very slim. And so these things are going through my mind. And I remember they finally ordered the Cleveland Clinic to come. A six-man crew came to take Becky. How many were there when that happened? And I, Damon actually took a video that night. He was 12 years old, and he videoed Becky going down the hall with these guys. It was, it was incredible. The chopper left Altman at what time, Carmen? 
10, I think it was 10, 10, 50, 10, um, is when it arrived at Cleveland. Oh, when it arrived at Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was around 10, 20 or so, I think is when they lifted off at Altman to leave. And, and so Javen, Becky's brother, uh, drove me and Damon and uh, Chloe up to Altman. And I remember we went to McDonald's and ordered some sandwiches and they forgot mine. So I ended up giving it to my kids, and here I am, and it's like, I'm, been, I'm hungry. I remember so well that a shooting star was something very, very special to Becky. She was in her mid-30s before she ever saw her first one. And that shooting star meant the world, and it was a very pivotal moment in her life spiritually. And I had Damon under this arm. And I had Chloe under this one. And I remember I said, guys, let's pray. We're in the back of this van headed to Cleveland Clinic. And this was my prayer. I said, God, you know where we're at. You know what's going on. We don't. I have so many questions why. I could, this is pretty much ad lib what I said. Damon, do you remember that? Not really. I said, I, if you bring Becky home in a coffin, I will give her the best funeral that I would know of. If you bring her home in a wheelchair like they say you're going to, I'll take care of her the best that I know how. But if you let her live a normal, healthy life, I will never shut up. And I let them go, and I looked out the window, and there went a shooting star almost a full length of the sky and I knew that was like Noah's rainbow for me this is going to be okay I, we got this God has this under control and so we get up to Cleveland Clinic and I think it was about 2 a.m. before I got in to see her and now I had been up quite a long time and I was pretty much butter brain and all this information and like not good news Monday that was this was now Tuesday morning at two and when I got into Becky's room they had see Becky had taught me and Damon and Chloe how to be thankful for things and her favorite number was three and she said that it's, it stands for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that when the threes line up in life, we need to praise God for something. We'd be going down the road and hit 3.33 p.m. Give God some praise. And we'd all be like, thank you, Lord. Like we had to. She made us. And she was like, this is a time to be thankful. And she was all into this. And, and uh, do you guys know 98 degrees in Fahrenheit when you take it to 91, does anybody have a clue what 91 degrees Fahrenheit translates into Celsius? I didn't either, and I, I walked into her room, and the little readout, I said, what is this? And he said, that's her temperature. And I'm like, 33.3. Like, she's frozen. <laughs> he said, that's Celsius. That's 91 in Fahrenheit. I said, really? Isn't God good? So every time for the next... Three days, two, two days, I would walk in and that little readout would remind me to be thankful for something. 333, 33.3. Just those little things along the way were confirmations that built my faith. Jesus never performed a miracle where there was no faith. He never did it when it interfered with God's will. We know that. He never did it to prove himself who he was. He does this to remind us of who he is. But God doesn't, we, we shouldn't, yeah. Anyway, we'll get to it. Let me, let me keep going. That's why I got fired up there. I've almost preached. I almost started. Tuesday evening, no good news. Wednesday morning, prognosis was not good. A team of doctors led by Dr. Michael Foe, there was 12 of them, came in to room 18, and they tell me the same news that John Pulaski had told Karma and I down at Altman already. He said, from here down, we feel like her vitals are good, but from here up, there's just not much there. They were audio recording and video recording every single move in that room, 
and they knew the things that made her heart rate spike, they asked to stop some of those things. And, and so uh, Wednesday was not a good day, but, but here's what happened. On Tuesday, in walks this guy, his name was Adam, and he came in, and he started, he, he said, I'm your RN for the next three days. It's going to be, two, no, Wednesday morning is when he came in. I'm sorry, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. He's going to be on for three twelves. And he said, uh, I'm going to do my best to keep her comfortable and keep you informed. I said, that's all I ask. Wednesday night, and, and by the way, the first day I had over 400 incoming texts, which <laughs> Alani almost should know how that is. It kind of like, <laughs> I love you, where are you at? It kind of drains your phone fairly fast, doesn't it? You got to keep it plugged in. She got a birthday wishes from all of you guys the other Sunday. That was great. But like you got to keep it plugged in. And so I decided I can't even answer them all. And so I'm just going to play worship music there by her bed. And I laid that on her pillow and we played worship music. And Karma was kind enough to start Becky's Praise and Prayer page. You can go check it out and you can see all of the daily updates there. And what, be- what Karma and I would do every evening is I would call her and I would say, Karma, this is what the doctor said today. And I believe so much that we need to continue to pray and that God would heal Becky in alignment of his word. And you can go on there most every day. It ended that way on those posts. I want God to heal her in alignment to his word because his word is true. There's truth there. And so we kept pressing in on that. And by Sunday, over 32,000 people had read that page. 32,000. I don't know 1,000. Yeah, I might know 1,000 people. But like, I don't know that many people. Like, where did all these people come from? And they were praying all across the world. Africa. Where all were they? Brennan was in Nepal. France. France. Africa. Yeah, there were people coming onto this page from all over saying, we join you in prayer. We can believe with you. We have faith with you that God would heal. So Wednesday evening, this song came on, Waiting Here for You. And Kurt leads that song every once in a periodically here for our worship segment. And uh, Waiting Here for You is sang by Jesus Culture and Martin Smith from Delirious. I don't know. Uh, they sang that together at a concert live in New York. And I think some of our youth at that time had been there. Do you guys remember anybody? Anyway, they had went to that uh, event over there. This song meant the world to Becky and I. We used to like, it, it like, it builds and then it drops down and it's just got cool effects to it. And this was one of her favorite songs. And it just talks about waiting here for you. What to do while you're waiting for God to move. And I was like, man, that is a cool, this is your song, Beck. And I'm sitting there. It's about 6.30 on Wednesday evening. And I'm, I'm just sitting there. Oh, Beck, this is your favorite song. You know how you do. No, you don't. I, this is how I did it. Like, and all of a sudden, I see a tear roll down her left cheek. I'm like, what? So I ran out. I get the, Adam. I said, Adam, I know your shift's about up. You've got to come see this. And he comes in. And he goes, oh, man, no, that's not a tear. That's actually excess moisturizer. I just, she's not capable of, she's paralyzed. And he said, there's no way to moisten her eyes. He said, that's just excess. I just got done doing that. (sighs) All right, so I wiped it off. I said, baby, can you hear me? And I kept whispering to her. All of a sudden, another tear ran down. So I got on YouTube. I quit my, my channel, and I got on YouTube and went on demand. This thing is like seven minutes long. And... And I start playing it, and sure enough, more tears start rolling. I could tell she's responding to this song, Waiting Here for You. I ran out and got Adam. I said, you got to come listen to this. He said, then afterwards, he goes, what kind of music is that? I said, it's worship music. He said, nah, man, I grew up in church. We never had music like that. I said, it's anointed worship music, for Pete's sake. (laughs) Anyway, too bad he couldn't be here today. He's coming here one of these weekends here. Great friend of ours today. We became very good friends through this. Anointed worship music. Thursday night, or Thursday, we started getting some flutters in the eyes, and they had started to warm her body back up slowly. 
started getting a little bit of movement Friday. I, uh, I told Adam, I said, this is your last day. When are you coming back next week? He said, I won't be back till Wednesday. I get, I get off, I'm off till Wednesday. And I said, well, out of all the nurses that we've had in here, I trust you the most. I want you to ex- extubate her today. And he goes, oh, <laughs> he says, son, let me tell you, it ain't happening until next week. He said, I'll do it when I get back next week. I said, no, 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 no. My wife's alive behind there. I need that thing out of there because she's starting to like swallow real bad. It's like this feeding tube was in her nose. This, this whole thing was blocking her. He said, if you want me to do that today, it would be a miracle. I said, well, get ready because it's going to happen today. And so at 6.20 p.m. Friday evening, he came in, he goes, I said, what does that mean? He said, I'm taking it out. I said, what? He said, I'm taking it out. And I remember her sister Rita was in the room with me and the practitioner who looked like Jesus. Literally, he did. He was, he was this little Venezuelan guy with long hair and blue eyes. And he had his foot up against the wall like this with his big white coat. And there he stood. And Adam had another intubation ready or there was a nurse beside him ready to put another one in in case Becky's brain didn't tell her to breathe. That's how critical this moment was. They could have only done this for not more than a minute. They were going to see if she catches because now by all this time she was on the highest form of life support that Cleveland Clinic had. This was the telltale moment. And he, Adam Pulls that thing out. I can still see it. And he looked and he goes, Becky, can you say hello? And she looked. She opened her eyes and she goes, hello. This guy standing over here said a few curse words that I won't repeat. He goes, that's incredible. And walks out of the room. I'll never forget it. That was an incredible moment. Let me tell you something. She was on a little bit of an oxygen mask, probably not as much as the COVID patients are on today for the next couple days. Uh, She reacted to some medicine, but she kept coming around. Some some cool things happened in what she said if she came out of there someday, I'll I'll tell you guys. She actually, she had a miscarriage uh, before we were married. Plug your ears, guys. Youth. Don't do that. She had a miscarriage before we were married. And when she came back, I asked her as she was coming back on Friday, I said, why are you coming back? Did you see Jesus? I did. Did you see heaven? Yes, it was beautiful. She's sort of groggy. And I said, who did you see out there? She goes, my kids. I said, how many? She said, four. I said, what? She said, Madison, Damon, Chloe, and Mason. We were going to name the first one Madison. You know she don't stretch things like I do, so I have to believe that. I said, how old was he? She said, oh, he was a teenager. Like she was making sense with this stuff. So we don't, I don't say that very often in the crowd, but you guys are home crowd, and I'll tell you that. That's the stuff that I was dealing with. And progressively, just slowly but surely, she got better. She went into that hospital on April the 15th. On April, the what day was it that they put the defibrillator in? One thing I wanted to say was when uh, she came back and started talking, they said that she's going to reboot, like her brain's going to yeah. reboot, and it's going to start at like kindergarten. Kindergarten. And go on up through, and we don't know if it's going to be a complete reboot or it yeah. might stop at kindergarten. She, so. She'll definitely be in kindergarten, but she may never progress further than that. Hallelujah, it didn't stop at kindergarten. Right. And so they put a defibrillator pacemaker in her, and two days later, on April the 30th, 15 days, I got her to sign her own release forms, and she walked to the car with me, and we came home. And I... I, And 
November of 2011, I woke up with a dream that I was on stage here playing worship music. And I was about right back here, and Becky was about where this guitar is. And I was playing here. And I remember I took my guitar off and I put it down and I grabbed her mic and I walked down in my vision. I walked down in the center here and I started talking. And before it was said and done, the whole church encircled the whole sanctuary. And me and Becky were left in the center of this aisle and I woke up. Tears rolling down my face. It's six in the morning. I go into the bathroom and said, God, what was that? I heard the Holy Spirit say, you've hid behind your guitar your whole life. I need you to put it down, and I want you to talk to the people. And I remember saying this out loud. I said, I will do that if you give me a different platform to preach from. I'm tired of the same washed-up grace and the same washed-up salvation that I've heard my whole life. My dad was a preacher. On April the 15th, 2012, when she, and, and as that progressed, I knew that that was my platform. There was no doubt about it. Because off of that platform, you can talk about hope. You can talk about faith. You can talk about healing. You can talk about resolve. Because Becky and I's marriage wasn't always good. You guys know that. There's so many things that God wants to heal us from. But I want to tell you, God's purpose of sending Jesus to this earth was not. His main purpose to, to come to this earth, you've got to remember, is to save souls. And the the, not the byproducts, but just the benefits of Jesus coming to earth brought miracles. Those are the benefits of Jesus coming to earth. It's not his primary focus for being here is not to heal your physical body because I'm going to tell you, he did it to Lazarus the first time, but the next time Lazarus died, he was on his own. So Becky and I have not argued one time since this. That is a bad job. I'm full of them this morning, guys. But I am so, so thankful that God gave me Becky back. And he gave me a platform of a story that I honor very, very much. And I want you to honor it, too. And you guys were a huge part of journeying through that story with us. They told me that she broke every rule of medicine. She shouldn't be here according to medicine standards. But God, see, it didn't interfere with God's perfect will. He wanted her here. And so he did a miracle. But next time, it might not be that way, and we all got to be okay with that. He's going to take me first. I can feel it anyway. Yeah, she's going to get back what she put me through. But I'm ready to go. I want you to know that. And that's my desire for every person sitting here today. When you can get to a point in your life that whether you live or whether you die, you're going to make an impact for the kingdom. Amen? All you youth, everyone sitting from the front to the back, he didn't come to heal our bodies. He came to save our souls. And I don't want you walking out of here today without the biggest miracle of all in your heart, knowing that you're saved. That is the ultimate act of faith. He can create miracles. He can do miracles, perform miracles, wherever there's faith. But the biggest one is saving of our souls. Karma, did I elaborate in any way too big or too small? You were right on. Oh, well, now that I don't believe. Give Karma a hand for being our referee today. Thank you, Karma. Becky, what do you have to say to these kind people? They are going overtime with you today. See how I did that? I took it right up to 11. Now it's up to you. Go ahead. No, they want to hear you. Um, so my side of the story is so much easier. Like, sometimes it's hard for me... Like when people are sick in the hospital, um, they have the easy part. The people, like my family and 
everybody here and everybody was praying for me, I really had the easy part. It was not hard to die. It was, it's, I was, like somebody always, um, Jimmy's grandpa, when he was still living, he asked me if I would pray for him that he would have an easy um, passing. passing. And I'm like, I never, like, I, at my age, I never thought of dying would be hard. And so, um, when, when I, when I quit breathing, it wasn't hard at all. It was, it's so easy. It's like, it was, you know, I, I didn't have a runny nose. There was nothing wrong with me. I had, didn't have a headache. I wasn't sick. I was just like this. And I just, I just quit. And so when you hear somebody like passing, they pass so quick that they're not suffering anymore. It's like your soul's gone. You're, you're done. You're out of here. It's, there's no pain. I had no pain. There was, um, there was no, I never struggled. They said they had to, they had to um, tie me down because I was thrashing and, and. That was, uh, as you were coming back, like Sunday, from Monday to Sunday, about Sunday. But she was I, reacting to all of the medicine. I don't remember like thrashing and I don't remember being sick. I don't have any bad memories of the hospital. I just took a break. I went to sleep for a while. And I am back <laughs> uh, 100%. I am completely normal. I don't have to do any nothing. I take two little heart pills every day. By the way, can I interject there? Yeah. So throughout the years, she kept doing stress tests and ejection fraction measurements, and we thought it was good when it hit 22, the ejection fraction. Now, yours as you're sitting here as a normal 55 to 60. And then I remember when it hit 35 about two years ago. Just lately, she did a stress test two weeks ago, and that test came back, her ejection fraction today is 52. I'm telling you, our faith should not hinge on what God does, but simply on who God is. Give these guys another round of applause. You are dismissed. Thank you very much. I've got a song that's about seven minutes long. You, yeah. Uh, that I put something... If you knew my mother-in-law, she snapped pictures of everything. <laughs> and she did take a couple pictures, but in the heart of a moment like that, we just didn't want to take a bunch of pictures, but we do have some that we compiled together and we put it to the soundtrack of Waiting Here For You. If you guys would stand, we're going to play that to end the service. And I would just tell you, in Psalms chapter, where is that, Haley? I should know that. Psalm chapter 147, verse 3. It says there that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. He doesn't just heal physically. He will heal emotionally. He will heal you, your broken relationships, your heartaches. God wants to do that for you. But it's not his primary reason of sending Jesus here. It's merely the benefits of having him come into earth. <laughs> so let's not get ca caught up and hung up if he does or doesn't do. Them. Our faith should be in who he is, not in what he does.